Well, let's turn now to Peter McKay, a former conservative minister of foreign affairs, defense and justice at different times. We asked him to join us this evening to, to get his thoughts on foreign interference in Canada's electoral process. Peter, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Listen, I want to start here by getting your thoughts on the, the Prime Minister's move today, acquiescing uh, to opposition demands and allowing his chief of staff to testify before committee. Was this always going to be necessary, or is this what Liberals had been arguing, just really a political play for the opposition to keep the issue alive? No, Michael, I think there was a certain inevitability to Katie Telford being called to committee. Um, let's not forget that the, she has been before the committee on previous occasions with respect to the so-called SNC-Lavalin affair and uh, pressuring Jody Wilson-Raybould, amongst others. And then the issue of the, the WE scandal with respect to uh, funding that was going to the Kielberger brothers. So um, this idea that chiefs of staff are somehow um, not relevant to the discussion in a parliamentary committee or, or subject to some kind of protection is simply not the case. And the pressure was mounting and mounting. And I, I think the overall impression of there being a cover-up or an attempt, <clears throat> pardon me, an attempt by the Prime Minister's office not to be accountable and not to have people around him accountable, uh, it simply became too much. And so she'll be well briefed and prepared when she comes to committee. But the question for her and for others is, when did they know, what did they know, and what did they do about it? And that is also, I would suggest, extending to whatever other investigation is to happen outside of Parliament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, of course, in addition to the news of Katie Telford today, the Prime Minister also released uh, the mandate letter for David Johnston. The former GG will have to submit recommendations uh, about the way forward here by the end of May. As you know, Mr. Johnston's ability to investigate independently has come under question. What do you make of his appointment and really his ability to do the job to the satisfaction of all Canadians? Well, firstly, this has very little to do with David Johnson, the person, David Johnson, the individual with amazing credentials and, and integrity. Um, but it has everything to do with, in fact, the, the fact that he is, has proximity to uh, the prime minister himself, which he has spoken of in terms of calling him a friend. Uh, and it has to do more so with the public impression of the individual who may be the subject of some of this investigation, deciding firstly who it is, and secondly, what the mandate is, Michael. So it's a, a, a baked in recipe for a conflict of interest that undermines public confidence right out of the gate. And so again, I say for emphasis, David Johnson has, uh, you know, if you were to list people uh, in our country that had uh, the highest of credentials and public confidence, Yes, but, and here's the important part, the but, the compromise position that he is in and his ability then to say, uh, you know, I, I've done this without any prior um, influence or, or interference from the person who may, in fact, or the office that may, in fact, be uh, very much the subject of the investigation. Plus, the mandate itself doesn't allow for uh, calling of witnesses under oath and perhaps going where he needs to go to get the answers that the public will demand. Is that the case, though? Because it's interesting, because when you go through that, that mandate letter, it does essentially say that he, he has the right to make recommendations. That includes a public inquiry. Uh, does that not answer some of the concern being expressed here by opposition members? Perhaps some, but I don't think all. And uh, the issue of whether, in fact, a recommendation for a public inquiry or even a judicial inquiry is the end result, we will know soon enough. I, I will say that, that there is a short time span upon which to complete this report and this advice to the Prime Minister. But even as I'm saying that, Michael, I, I remind us that we're asking somebody to investigate, to look into to try to shed further light, which this is what the public is demanding and what parliamentarians are demanding, and then report to the very person who may be the subject of this investigation. Now, that said, I, I also wonder about the extent of which an investigation going forward should look at, because so much of the focus has been on China right now. But writ right. large, the letter talks about foreign interference. What else do you think, or at least how far of an extent do you think this investigation actually needs to be? 
Well, I, I think it needs to be very in-depth and far-reaching. Uh, this touches upon, as you know well, the very cornerstone of our democracy and our ability to have confidence in electoral results. The, uh, the subject of the, the interference is not only, in my view, about our political system. It also has to be about the government itself. Uh, we know that there is prolific cyber activity, intrusion into the, the private sector as well and businesses. Uh, we know the, the sad saga of Nortel, and there are other examples uh, for which many are, are aware. I, I chaired the National Security Committee for almost 10 years. And so the subject of foreign interference is very broad and touches in all parts of, of uh, our country. Um, and so, and it also goes beyond China, as you alluded to. So this should be given the highest priority. There should be some very serious recommendations and resources that are put to stopping it, cutting it off, and uh, and working with our allies, of course, in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So, so as one with your experience, then Peter, when you look at this case and certainly the the, the cases beforehand, what kind of protective regime do you hope comes out of this whole controversy? Well, I, I think the the foreign registry is a is a good start. I think we need to look at some of the organizations who are seized first and foremost with protecting Canadians their privacy, their intellectual property. So CSIS, obviously, the RCMP, but also our uh, communication security establishment, which is under the auspices of the Department of National Defense. I think uh, FinTrack, uh, various uh, agencies that work together to try to combat all sorts of, of online illicit activity that uh, we need to be concerned about. And of course, as I, as I mentioned, we need to be able to work with our international allies. It's Unfortunate that we're on the outside of AUKUS, which is also an intelligence sharing body in addition to some of their, their other mandate. But uh, the Five Eyes, our, our uh, allies in Europe, we, uh, we are now living in this very interconnected world, which has been great for many aspects, including trade, but it also has left us more vulnerable and behind the curve in some cases on the ability of, of our adversaries to reach into our country and exert influence. And then there's the, the personal influence, of uh, which is part of the subject of this, this rapporteur's mandate, and that is, were there candidates who were compromised? Was there foreign money that was brought into our Canadian electoral system? These are very serious allegations that have left Canadians shaken, and I would suggest even more cynical about uh, the transparency that's needed. Well, the process is beginning. Uh, Peter, perhaps we'll have the chance to speak again. But for now, thank you. Really appreciate the time tonight. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. And that's Peter McKay.